There's that pregnant pause that says we are ready for you. That's good. I always like that. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon at the John Hewitt Summer School. My name is Peggy Hughes and it's an absolute pleasure to be here and to be here with John Boyne uh, this afternoon. Um, how the event's going to work, we, basically I'll tell you a little bit about John. Um, we're going to have um, a little chat up here with some uh, a few wee readings and then we'd love it very much if you would come in with your questions and comments as well. Um, we're here to talk about this not small um, piece of wonder, The Heart's Invisible Furies, which um, I have read and loved so much that you can see, witness, uh, that it's been, that's been around the place with me, and um, some of you may have read it, and if not, you're in for a treat. Um, a little bit more about John, uh, born in Dublin, went to Trinity, uh, where he studied English lit before going to the University of East Anglia, where he studied um, creative writing in Norwich. He's written 10 novels for adults and five for younger readers, including the exponentially successful Boy in Striped Pyjamas, of course, which sold nine million copies and was a Merrimax feature film. But as I say, we're here to talk about this. His fiction for adults has taken us to the high seas and the wild west. It has traversed centuries and continents, earning John the accolade of Ireland's most venturesome writer, which I really like, the idea of an adventurer, and prizes which include the Hennessy Literary uh, Prize for his body of work for children, and several Irish book awards, among many other things. Um, so as I say, we're here to talk about this, but I would just join you while we gather our thoughts up here, if you would just give another really warm welcome to our man. So John, before we hear our reading, I just wonder if you would just set the scene for us with the Hearts and Visible Furies. Where did it come from, um, and, and what are we going to hear as well? Uh, well, good afternoon everybody, firstly, thank you for coming along. Um, it's a novel that's set over 70 years of Irish history. It begins in 1945, immediately after the end of the Second World War, and it carries on until 2015, um, to about a month after the Equal Rights Marriage Referendum in, in the South. Um, so it follows Irish history through those 70 years in gaps of seven years at a time. We see the story through the eyes of a man called Cyril Avery, who is zero at the start of the book. He tells the first chapter from the womb, and then every chapter that follows is seven years later. And Cyril is, uh, his mother in the opening chapter is 16 years old from West Cork, uh, married, oh, sorry, unmarried, but pregnant, and is called out from the pulpit of the church and banished from the parish. She goes to Dublin where she gives up the baby for adoption. And um, from there on we really just follow his story, trying to figure out who he is in life. He, through his teenage years, he's starting to come to terms with the fact that he's gay. Um, he, his parents, his adoptive parents, while never cruel to him, in any way, uh, are sort of disinterested in him. They treat him very much like an adult from the time he, was, he arrives. In fact, in some ways, he's the only adult in the house. Um, and um, so he has a sort of a strange upbringing and a, a stranger life ahead as he's just trying to, you know, get through life the way we all do. I wonder if you could expand a little bit on the title. I love the title. There's a story, I think, behind it. Yeah, The Hearts of Visible Furies. It, it comes from um, uh, a line of... Uh, Hannah Arendt, the philosopher, who, who talks about uh, the poet W.H. Auden as having the heart's invisible furies carved onto his face. Anybody who's seen a picture of Auden from, particularly when he was an old man, will know he, uh, I can't remember the name of that disease, but it's uh, where the face just turns into like extraordinary numbers of wrinkles. Uh, and I came across this line as I was writing, I was reading it as I was writing the book, and I sort of stole it for, um, uh, to use that one character would quote Hannah Arendt saying this. Um, but it, it made a, a nice title for the book as well because um, there's a lot of anger in the book. It's, it's ostensibly a comedy in most ways, which I've never written before. Anybody who's familiar with my previous books will know they tend to be quite sad, but this one is for the most part a comedy. But there is still a lot of anger in it because Cyril himself growing up and into his 20s, his 30s, in the 60s, 70s in Ireland when it was very difficult uh, for him or for a, a real life figure such as him um, to explore his own sexuality, to form relationships uh, in a country where homosexuality was still a criminal offence. So there is anger in the book, but uh, it's also about love, because he's, he's, he's looking for that all the way through it. Okay, so I mentioned that it's um, in ten chapters of seven years apiece. This um, first piece is in 1952, when he is seven years old. And Cyril uh, is living in this house with his adoptive parents. He, he's very lonely, he doesn't really have any friends. <coughs> But he comes downstairs uh, one day and he sees another seven-year-old boy sitting in the, um, the hallway of the house whose father is a solicitor who's come to see his, his own father about something. Um, and this relationship is going to be very important as the novel develops. But this is what happens when they meet first. On the afternoon that we met, we exchanged only a few, few pleasantries in the hallway. 
before I invited him upstairs, as children do, to see my room, and he followed me cheerfully and without question to the top of the house. As he stood beside my unmade bed, examining the books on the shelves and the toys that lay scattered on the floor, it occurred to me that he was the first child, other than myself, ever to set foot in there. You're lucky to have so much space, he said, balancing on the tips of his toes as he looked out the window into the square beyond. You have all of this to yourself. Yes, I said, for my domain consisted of three rooms, a bedroom, a small bathroom and a living area, which, I suppose, made it more of a self-contained <coughs> apartment than anything else. Charles has the first floor, Mort has the second, and we all share the ground. You mean your parents don't sleep together, he asked. Oh no, I said. Why, do yours? Yes, of course they do. But why? Don't you have enough bedrooms? <laughs> don't be a four, he said. My bedroom's next door to my sister's. Girls are strange creatures, don't you think? I don't know any, I admitted. I know lots. I love girls, even though they're crazy and mentally unbalanced, according to my father. Have you ever seen a pair of breasts? I stared at him in surprise. I was only seven years old. Such thoughts had not yet occurred to me. But even then, Julian's sexually precocious mind was already turning towards women. No, I said. I have, he told me proudly. At a beach on the Algarve last summer, all the girls were going around topless. I got sunburned, I stayed out so long. Second degree burns. I can't wait to have sex with a girl, can you? <laughs> I frowned. The word was a new one to me. What sex, I asked. You really don't know, he asked. No, I said, and he took great delight in describing in detail actions that to me seemed not just unpleasant and unsanitary, but possibly criminal. <laughs> oh, that, I said when he was finished, pretending I'd known all along, for I didn't want him to look down on me. Oh, I thought you were talking about something else entirely. I know all about that. <laughs> Do you have any dirty magazines, he asked me then. No, I said. I have. I found one in my father's study. It was full of naked girls. It was an American magazine, of course, because naked girls are illegal in Ireland. <laughs> are they? I asked. Yes, the church don't let girls be naked until they're married, but the Americans do. And they take all their clothes off all the time and they let the pictures go into magazines. And then men go into shops and they buy them with copies of History Today or Stamps Monthly so they don't look like perverts. <laughs> What's a pervert? I asked. It's someone who's a sex maniac. Oh. I'm going to be a pervert when I grow up. <laughs> so am I, I said, eager to please. Perhaps we could be perverts together. <laughs> Even as the words came out of my mouth, I could tell there was something not quite right about them. And the expression on his face, one of disdain combined with mistrust, embarrassed me. I don't think so, he said. That's not how it works at all. Boys can only be perverts with girls. Oh, I said, disappointed. Do you have a big thing? He asked a few moments later, after picking up all the keepsakes on my desk and putting them back down in the wrong places. Do I what? I asked. A big thing, he repeated. You need a big thing if you want to be a pervert. Shall we see who's his biggest? I bet mine is. My mouth dropped open in surprise and I felt a curious stirring at the pit of my stomach, an entirely new sensation that I couldn't quite understand but that I felt happy to encourage. <coughs> all right, I said. You first, said Julian. I hesitated, but not wanting him to change his mind and move on to a different game, I undid my belt buckle and pulled my trousers and underwear down to my knees, and he leaned forward, an interested expression on his face, as he stared at it. I think that's what they call average, he said, <laughs> after a moment. I'm only seven, I said, feeling offended as I pulled my pants back up. Yeah, well, I'm only seven too, but I'm bigger, he said, pulling his trousers down to show me, and this time I could feel the room spin a little. I knew there was danger to this, that to be caught would be to invite trouble and disgrace, but the risk excited me. His was definitely bigger and it fascinated me, for it was the first penis outside of my own I had ever seen, and as he was circumcised, and I was not, it intrigued me. Where's the rest of it? I asked. What do you mean? He said, pulling his pants up. The rest of your thing, I said. Well, they cut it off when I was a baby. I felt a stab of pain run through me. Why would they do that? I asked. I'm not sure, he said. It happens to lots of boys when they're young. It's a Jewish thing. Are you Jewish? No. It won't happen to me, I said, horrified by the notion of anyone coming up my nether regions with a knife. Well, it might. Anyway, have you ever been to France? <laughs> to France, I asked. No, why? We're going there on our summer holidays this year, that's all. Oh, I said, disappointed that we'd moved away from talking about sex, perverts, and things, as I would have liked to continue discussing them for a little while longer. 
but he seems to have grown bored of them now. Why do you call your parents Charles and Maud? he asked. They prefer it that way, I said. I'm adopted, you see, and it's to show that I'm not a real Avery. He laughed and shook his head. A tap on the door disturbed us and I turned round. What's the matter? asked Julian. Nothing. You look nervous. It's just that no one ever comes up here, I said. I watched as the door handle slowly turned, then took a step back, and Julian, infected by my anxiety, moved towards the window. A moment later, a cloud of smoke entered the room, followed inevitably by Maud. I hadn't seen her in days and was surprised that her hair was not quite as blonde as usual, and she was looking painfully thin. Maud, I said, surprised to see her there. Cyril, she replied, glancing around, surprised to see another boy in the room. There you are, but who is this? Julian Woodbeat, said Julian in a confident tone. My father is Max Woodbeat, the famous solicitor. He extended a hand and she stirred at it, as if baffled by its appearance. What do you want? She asked, money? No, said Julian. My father says it's good manners to shake hands upon making a new acquaintance. Oh, I see, she said, leaning over and examining his fingers. Is it clean? Have you been to the bathroom lately? Did you wash your hands afterwards? It's perfectly clean, Mrs Avery, said Julian. She sighed, reached out her own hand and shook his for about a tenth of a second. You have very soft skin, she said, purring little. Little boys generally do, of course, they're not used to hard work. How old are you, if you don't mind my asking? I'm seven, said Julian. No, Cyril is seven, she said. I was asking how old you are. Well, I'm seven too, he said, we both are. Both seven, she asked. Isn't that a bit of a coincidence? <laughs> well, I don't think it is, he said. Everyone in my class at school is seven, and everyone in Cyril's, I imagine. There's probably the same number of seven-year-olds in Dublin as there are people of any age. Eh, replied Maud, unconvinced. Might I ask what you're doing in Cyril's bedroom? Did you know you were coming? You're not being unpleasant to him, are you? He does seem to attract bullies. Julian was sitting in the hallway, I told her, on the ornamental chair that isn't supposed to be used. Oh no, said Maud. That was my mother's. I didn't damage it, said Julian. My mother was Evelyn Hartford, said Maud, as if this would mean something to one of us. So as you know, she simply adored chairs. <laughs> well, they are terribly useful, replied Julian, if one wants to sit down on I mean. it. Well, yes, said Maud, but not the ornamental chair, I pointed out. You told me never to sit in that one. That's because you have a habit of collecting dirt, she said. Julian, on the other hand, looks rather clean. Did you have a bath this morning? I did, said Julian, but then I have a bath most mornings. Good for you. I find it almost impossible to persuade Cyril to wash. That's not true, I said, insulted. I would, however, ask you not to sit in it again, if you don't mind, continued Maud. You have my word, Mrs. Avery, said Julian, performing a little bow at the waist that made her smile. You write novels, don't you? He asked her. That's right, she said. How did you know? My, mother told, my father told me. He said he hasn't read any himself, because you mostly write about women. I do, she admitted. Might I ask why? Because the male writers never do. They don't have the talent, you see, or the wisdom. Julian's father is here to see Charles, I said keen to turn the conversation away from chairs and books. When I discovered him downstairs, I thought he might like to come up and see my room. And did you? asked Maud. Did you want to see Cyril's room? Yes, very much so. Someone died up here once, you know, said Maud. What? I asked a Paul too. <laughs> this was the first time I'd heard this. Oh, I can't remember. Some man, I think, or possibly a woman. A person, shall we say. It was all such a long time ago. Was it natural causes, Mrs. Avery? asked Julian. No, I don't think so. If memory serves, he, she, or it was murdered. <laughs> I'm not sure if the killer was ever caught. It was in the old papers at the time. She waved her hand in the air and some ash fell on my head. I can't remember the details very well, she said. Was there a knife involved? For some reason, I have the word knife in my head. A stabbing, said Julian, rubbing his hands together in glee. Okay, I'll take a pause. <laughs> Very tempted, John, to just ask you loads of questions about Maud, but we'll leave her just, just for now. Um, does a character like Cyril, I'm interested in how you as a writer know that that's someone you're going to develop across you know, several decades. What, what is it about someone like Cyril that, that allows that to be the case? Um, but I've always, as a reader, I've always enjoyed novels. My favourite types of novels really are the ones that start with a, a child at birth and carry all the way up um, to the end of their life. You know, I was, uh, you'd get that a lot in Dickens, who was my hero as a, when I was, well, I still, like Dickens is still one of my favourites, but the first kind of adult writer I really got into. Um, and my kind of contemporary literary hero was John, Ir John Irving, uh, to whom this book is in fact dedicated. And uh, a lot of his books do that as well, following a character uh, from birth to death. 
And because I wanted to look at the history of Ireland over those 70 years and how the country had changed um, socially, particularly, um, it seemed reasonable to just do it through, through one person's own story because their story was going to reflect the changes in the country. And um, so that's, that's really where it started for me. Now, I don't plan the novels in advance. I, don't, I never knew where it was going to go, particularly, other than the basic structure. Uh, I knew where it was going to start and I knew how it was going to end, but everything in the middle um, was a bit of a mystery. And it's 600 pages long, so it's um, a, a lot of mystery for me starting out. But that's just the way I prefer to do it. Um, and it <laughs> changes. Because that, that sounds quite a terrifying way of working. Sure, well, what you're it's a, no, it's for me, it works well. And when I started out, you know, my first novel was published 17 years ago, and I think my first four um, I used to plot out quite a lot. And anytime I've taught classes to um, young aspiring writers or whatever, I, I always say it's best to do that when you're starting out, particularly because the, the trick with writing a novel, particularly when you're trying to figure it out, is actually finishing the thing. Um, you'll gain so much confidence from doing that. And so, if you have some sort of plot laid out, if you have it all on paper, that's going to make that happen. But I feel that in time, um, with maybe confidence and experience, then you can take the safety net away a little bit. And so that's what I did after about sort of five books. And now I would find it a bit boring for me, to be honest, if I knew everything before I started out. Um, having said that, I think sometimes there are parts of a book which somehow are hidden at the back of your head, you know, and you kind of know them, but you don't know them, if that makes any sense. They're sort of they reveal themselves as the story goes on because you never really know what a book is about until you finish the first draft. You might think you know what it's about. You might think you know where it's going and what you're writing about and what the theme is. But really it should change, you know, particularly in that first draft. It should go in an unexpected direction. And you should get to the end of that first draft and say, oh, actually, I thought it was about this, but it turns out it's about this. And, and that for me is the, the um, continuing excitement of writing novels. Does it sound a little like the book has its own agency, or at least the characters do? do you well, they, they do in the sense of, particularly I think, you know, with a first person, strangely enough, all the books I've written for young people are all third person novels, and the books for adults are first person novels. And I find with these first person novels that you have to let that character take over and live their own life. And, you know, as I said earlier, I didn't expect this one to be funny at all. Um, I thought it was going to be, I thought it was really going to be about a guy who. Um, is in his 70s after that marriage referendum and is looking back on a life which has been essentially quite lonely and um, in which he, he doesn't find love and almost is almost resents the fact that young people today have it easier and it just it changed really in that second chapter because the first chapter is quite dark and quite violent but in the section that I just read you um, it changed there because of because of really of that type of scene where I just thought actually it would be funny if, it would be better if he's almost like the, no pun intended, the straight man in the story and everyone else is a bit of a lunatic around him and, um, and he just has to kind of keep finding his way through them. And if, if it feels right, you know, if instinctively it feels right, you have to go with that. And, but it's, it is part of the joy of it, I think, of writing that uh, it'll take you in unexpected directions. So I wonder if after um, History of Loneliness, which, which is, is a very sad book, and, and Father Yates is, is a sad character, if this was then quite a kind of ref, re refreshing uh, world to be in, even though it's kind of the same world. Yeah, um, it was, but actually both were, because History of Loneliness, the previous book, which, as you say, was about the child abuse scandals in the church, was the first book I'd, re I'd written um, set in Ireland, um, despite the fact that it was my, I don't know, 13th book, maybe. Um, and even though that's quite a dark book and a very sad book and um, goes to some very un unhappy and unpleasant places, because I was opening my mind suddenly to Ireland and to the experiences of growing up and writing about the streets in which I grew up, the school I went to, um, so many different parts of my own life, that was actually, uh, strange as it might sound, it was a very enjoyable book to write. Um, it, just because I was no, I didn't have to do the research maybe that I was, I had done for like writing about the Russian Tsar or the First World War, um, I could just kind of make it up as I went along and use my own memories and experiences, and that travelled on I think then to this book, where again, well there was a bit more research in this one because you know I had to find out a lot about underground bars and how people lived in those days, but that aside, um, I could just make it up um, and. Using the imagination is, is a great treat, actually, especially when you spent a lot of time writing 
historical novels, which are, uh, you know, you, try, you have to know as much as possible and still people will, will find problems in them. You know. yeah. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the structure, um, particularly the seven year kind of span mm. and, and how you hit on that, um, <clears throat> and also what that does to a reader, but maybe we'll come back to that. Well, they say that every seven years, you know, we shed our skin entirely. And my younger sister informed me a couple of years ago, I don't know if it's true or not, but that apparently every seven years in your life, and you can all think about this for yourselves, every seven years in your life, you, you are at some sort of crossroads and something happens to, to change things. And when I thought about my own life, that was probably, give or take, true. And what was nice with these gaps was that you could, I could write a long, chapter, you know, maybe 20,000 words set in 1959. Um, but whatever happened at, at the end of the chapter, immediately when you turn the page, we'll move seven years ahead. What, like, Cyril's already over it. I don't have to deal with a lot of the fallout, you know, um, if somebody dies or something terrible happens. Uh, we can just move straight on, you know. Um, people do die, and, you know, in, in a different type of novel, you'd have a whole long chapter about grief. Which I thought I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want seven. I don't want twenty thousand words of somebody grieving. I want to just get back to to the story. And so it was kind of nice to to do that. And for the reader, then, as each chapter would develop, you're trying to fill in the gaps of what's happened in the missing bits. You know, and and I was too. I would throw down little little tidbits of information, and I would have a good idea of what happened in the middle bits. But you just throw down little bits of information, and I think it's just kind of a fun way of approaching it. Yeah, structurally, I, I, I did something a few, it must be, I don't know, eight years ago or something, if anybody's read um, The House of Special Purpose, uh, which is a novel I set during the uh, three years leading up to and the 60 years immediately after the Russian Revolution. And I told two stories in that, one moving forward from 1916 to 1918, and one moving backwards from, uh, I think it was 1979, back to 1918. And then at the end, the two stories collided and met. And I quite like using structure in unusual ways, if it doesn't seem gimmicky, if it seems like the story will still be um, understandable to a reader, it's not going to confuse the hell out of everybody, but um, I, I kind of like playing around with it a little bit. Have you had loads of frustrated readers though saying, what happened in that seven year, you know, the kind of... Um... I, I don't think, no I haven't really, because I, I, I didn't want it to be like just complete blanks, I, I think there's enough going on in the rest of it that you can figure out um, what's happened, and most of the dramatic moments happen in the real pages. So, no, I, I think it's okay. Also in terms of sticking with kind of colluding with the reader or collaborating with the reader, um, the fact that the reader is, is sort of one step ahead and knows things that the characters in the book don't is somehow very satisfying, and I wonder why that is, if you've got any sense as a writer of why that is. I, I think, well for me, I think um, that is something that I've picked up a lot from the books actually that I write for young people. Because in all five of those books, the the protagonist, usually an eight, nine-year-old boy at the center of the story, is quite naive to a very adult event that's happening around him, whether it's the First World War, the Second World War, the death of a parent, um, in any of those books. But the reader is one step ahead, is a little bit smarter, uh, particularly in the historical aspect where the reader knows what the child is involved in. Um, so I think I kind of adapted that a little bit to, to this book. Um, I thought, you know, the reader would, so once the reader gets this structure, they'd start wondering where it's going to go, what's, uh, you're thinking, okay, well, what will happen, what was happening in Ireland in 1980 or in 1987, you know, you get to 1987, and of course, you know, the whole chapter is about AIDS, because if you're going to write a book like this, then you get to the 80s, you're going to have to write about um, that subject, so I was wondering about people thinking that, if anybody's read um, one of my favourite books of recent years, The Slap, by Christos Chalkas, the Australian writer, and the structure of that is eight different characters, um, each long chapter is built around one of the characters in this group of friends and family. And if you don't skip ahead in the book, once you start to understand how the structure works, and there's a lot of other characters, maybe 15 characters in the book, you start as a reader to say to yourself, I really hope there's a chapter built around such and such because I, I'm interested in that character. And when you get to the term, every so often there would be a surprise. You'd go, oh, I didn't expect that person. So it's the same in a different sort of way, just using years, you know, where it, it would take you to a place and the reader might have some suspicion of what was going, or me memory of what was going on in Ireland then, um, and sometimes it would be right and sometimes I'd do something different with it. 
Speaking of characters, I do need to ask you all about uh, Maud Avery, oh. who was so real to me. There's the bit at the start of the book that I googled thinking, have you ever heard of an Irish writer called Maud Avery? Uh-uh. And I suppose that's what we were supposed to do. Yeah. Um, could you just, just what, what was it like hanging out with her? I just um, actually wondered. Well, Maud is, Maud's only in uh, a very short part of the book, she's only in one chapter. Um, but I think everybody who's, anybody who's read this book um, seems to love Maud the best. She's, she's a novelist who, uh, she, she's written six or seven novels. Um, but she hates the idea of anybody buying them. She thinks that popularity is incredibly vulgar. I have no such crimes. Um, at one point in the book, she she her, one of her books hits the bestseller list, and she you know she practically collapses in a swoon. Um, she just hates the idea of it. Um, but I'm I'm using her also. Uh, she she's quite she's there a little bit for comic uh, relief in the book, but. There is something more to it. It's it is quite a feminist book in its way, and I wanted to talk a little bit about um, female writers and how female writers generally are treated and perceived. And there's a lot, a lot of mentions in the book of you know what I was called the tea towel. You know the tea towel. You know with the tea towel that has like the eight great Irish writers on it, male writers. You know Joyce or Casey, Singh, whatever, um, and it's beer mats and it's key rings and it's calendars and it's the same. You know, but for the sake of Brevity in this, I just keep calling it the tea towel, and then all these male writers get on the tea towel, but the women just use, are only allowed to use the tea towel to dry the dishes. Um, and so there's the question, the question of whether Maud, who, as the book develops, when she's well out of the story, when she's already gone, basically is. People feel that she's the greatest Irish novelist ever. Um, will she make her way onto this this tea towel? Um, and, you know, we've all, I mean, we're all readers here, and we've all seen it with the difference between how a, a young male writer and a young female writer is treated in, in, in all sorts of ways, from jacket design on books to, um, you know, who they read with at events, what order people read in. Um, I was at a festival recently where um, there was two or three male writers reading in one afternoon and two or three female writers reading at a, another afternoon, and they were all... I would say, I think anybody would say, of um, equal status in the literary world. And the, the, the little line under the three male writers was, you know, um, three of the great literary writers of our time, blah, blah, blah. And under the female writers was th- um, three wonderful storytellers gathered together. Yeah. And this, you know, it's that kind of like subtle um, diminishment. Um, <laughs> nothing wrong with storytelling, you know, I consider myself a storyteller. But it's just the use of one word rather than another. So I wanted to, to talk about that and um, how Maud is treated uh, in the book by the establishment and uh, by the Irish writing world. She's doing a lot of heavy lifting for the women there. I think. Yeah. That's, that's good. I thought about writing one of her books. Um, <laughs> but there's one that keeps being referred to. Um, and in my previous book, there was a young writer in it um, who, who had written a book called Spiegel Tent. And I thought about writing that, like, and, and just publishing under the writer's name. And I thought about publishing Maud's book under. Uh, she has a book that, that keeps being referred to called "Light to the Lark," um, which is from one of Shakespeare's sonnets. And I thought about writing. I thought about if I did, you know, writing like sort of thirty thousand words, and making it like the most pretentious, arch, you know, nonsense ever written, and uh, see what would happen. Maybe I do that anyway. No. Um, sort of a hyper-realness or, or met- metafictional stuff yeah. seems to be a very rich scene for you. That, you know, if it was a film, I guess, you know, it would be the DVD extras. You know, you'd have Maud's, Maud's novel. Yeah. I'm thinking you're so. going to run into, into a certain literary treasure in the pub as well. That kind of like... Yes, yeah, Brendan Bean shows up in the novel. Quite a few real-life figures show up. Charlie Hockey shows up um, at one point, um, which is quite a fun to write about him. And, but Brendan Bean is the biggest scene, I think. When Julian and Cyril are 14, they go to the Palace Bar, which for many of you know, in Westmoreland Street in Dublin, um, with um, Julian's girlfriend and a girl they're setting Cyril up with. Um, you know, they're trying to get served drink underage. But Brendan Bean happens to be there and comes over and um, just causes chaos, really, at the table. In terms of writing those comic scenes, how, how does that flow for you then in, your, in, the, in the whole process of writing the novel? Would you say, do you, do you think, I want to scene with Brendan Bean, this is going to happen, and then... Where can I insert it, or how, how do you? Um, no, it's the same as dramatic scenes. It's 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 um, it's very instinctive, and it's you know I would be writing every single day, and when I'm working on a book, particularly on the first draft, I'd be writing all day, every day, and trying to get to a place where you're not actively thinking about where it's going, but that 
the sentences, the scenes are leading you there. Um, I prefer it like that rather than sort of thinking, what would I, I, I can't imagine almost just sort of sitting back and thinking, what can I do now? What would happen next? It's, um, it's, it's different than that. It's like when you're not writing it then, the novel is sort of up in your head. You know, if you're watching TV or having a shower or whatever, you know, and those little things are developing. And sometimes you put things in a book and you don't know why they're there, but they reveal themselves later on. They, it, it all makes sense. So I try to let it be very instinctive. And I think if you're fortunate enough to be able to write all the time, which is what I do, uh, I think the brain slightly changes. You know, you, you, it's, it's any type of muscle. You know, you, uh, you're open to story all the time. You're, you're not having to uh, desperately sort of think what could happen. It's sort of lots of different like, ideas would come. And I don't know, that's not, I'm not making a very sensible answer there, but it, 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 somehow it just seems to work, and I don't know how particularly. In terms of plotting, you said you don't really plot, but was um, the equal marriage referendum always an end? Oh yeah, that was always the end. That's Because um, I, I looked at 2015 at the, being the end, and I thought it would be about 70, so that brought me back to 45, which was very handy because it's the end of the war. So it's kind of a nice place to start, because any country immediately after the war suddenly changes back to, or changes forward, you know, into a different type of world. So I knew I wanted the last chapter to take place in the immediate aftermath of of that referendum. And I was writing it um, before the referendum took place. So, uh, I mean, it was on the cards, we knew it was going to happen, and it seemed very obvious it was going to pass. Um, and well, for a variety of reasons, thankfully it did, but if it hadn't passed, it would have had a different ending, obviously. So. I love how this book, though, it's, it's a book with a gay character in it rather than, you know, an LGBT book. It seems to me it's, it just happens that the, the character's gay. Would you say that's the case, or um, were you trying to explore that? Well, a little of both. I mean, I'm definitely trying to explore what it was like for a gay man in Ireland over those times. Um, but that can also stand as a metaphor for the country, for how the country has changed. You know, it, it's a natural follow-on from a history of loneliness because when you examine how the church has failed people and how the country changed in the wake of all those scandals, then that leads you quite naturally onto how society changed after that. How aren't you know? How suddenly you know? There was divorce. There was firstly civil partnerships. There was um, equal rights marriage. You know whether the eighth event, the referendum on that will go ahead. You know you you start to see how things change. So yeah, it's I don't want to diminish though, the fact that it is about again character and it's about his life and about um, what it was like to grow up in a society where um, the essential part of your being is illegal and you could be thrown in jail for acting upon it, uh, which I think could be quite scary. Right, this bit takes place um, seven years later, so he's 14, and Julian has been kidnapped by the IRA. Um, and his father won't pay the, the ransom, because he doesn't um, want to, really. Um, so the IRA are sending back little bits of Julian every day in matchboxes. So they've sent back a thumb, uh, an ear, and a toe. And Cyril, who is now his roommate in school, is absolutely devastated because he's got this extraordinary crush on Julian. And he thinks that uh, the reason all these terrible things are happening is because of who he is, because of his nature. Um, so he decides to repent and he goes to confession. There were a couple of dozen people scattered around the pews, staring into space, all of them old, and I walked past them looking for a confession box with a light on. When I found one, I stepped inside, closing the door behind me, and waited in the darkness for the grill to slide open. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned, I said quietly, when it did, a gust of body odour rushing towards me with such force that I reared back and hit my head against the wall. <laughs> it has been three weeks since my last confession. What age are you, son? asked the voice from the other side, which sounded quite elderly. Fourteen, I said, I'll be fifteen next month. Fourteen-year-old boys need to go to confession more than once every three weeks, he said. I know what you lads are like, up to no good every minute of the day. Will you promise me you'll go more often in the future? I will, Father. Good lad. Now, what sins do you have to confess to the Lord? I swallowed hard. I had been going to confession fairly regularly since my first communion, seven years earlier. But not once had I ever told the truth. <laughs> like everyone else, I simply made up a collection of ordinary decent sins and rattled them off in a little thought before accepting the obligatory penance of ten Hail Marys and our Father. Today, however, I have promised myself that I would be honest. I would confess everything 
And if God was on my side, if God really existed and forgave people who were truly contrite, then he would recognise my guilt and set Julian free without any further harm. Father, over the, last six, over the last month, I have stolen sweets from a local shop on six occasions. Holy God, said the priest, appalled. Why did you do that? Because I like sweets, I said, and I can't afford them. Well, there's some logic to that, I suppose. But tell me, how did you do it? There's an old woman who works behind the counter, I said, and all she does is sit there reading her newspaper. It's easy to take things without ever notice them. That's a terrible sin, said the priest. You know, that's probably that good woman's livelihood. I do, Father. Will you promise me never to do such a thing again? I will, Father. All right. Good lad. Anything else? Yes, Father, I said. There's a priest in our school who I don't like very much, and in my head, I call him the prick. <laughs> the what? The prick. What in God's name does that mean? Do you not know, Father, I asked. If I knew it, I'd be asking you. It's another word for a, you know, for a thing. A thing? What do you mean a thing? What class of a thing? A thing, Father, I said. I don't know what you're talking about. I leaned in and whispered through the grill, a penis, Father. Holy God, he repeated. <laughs> Why in God's name would you call a priest in your school a penis? How could he possibly be a penis? A man can't be a penis, he can only be a man. This makes no sense to me at all. I'm sorry, Father, that's why I'm confessing it. Well, whatever it is, just stop doing it. Call him by his proper name and show him a bit of respect. I'm sure he treats all the lads in your school very well. He doesn't, Father. He's vicious and he's always beating us up. Last year he put a boy in the hospital for sneezing too loud. I don't care. You'll call him by his proper name or there'll be no forgiveness. Do you understand me? <laughs> yes, Father. Right then. I'm almost afraid to ask, but is there anything else? <laughs> there is, Father. Go on, so I'll hold on to my chair. It's a bit delicate, Father. Well, that's what the confession is for, son, he said. Don't worry, you're not talking to me. You're talking to God. He sees everything and he hears everything. You can have no secrets from God. So I have to say it then, Father. Will you not know anyway? He will, but he likes you to say it out loud, just for clarification purposes. <laughs> I took a deep breath. This had been a long time coming, but here it was at last. I think I'm a bit funny, Father. I told him. The other boys in my class, they're always talking about girls, but I never think about girls at all. I just think about boys. I think about doing all sorts of dirty stuff to them, like taking their clothes off and kissing them all over and playing with their things. And there's this one boy, he's my best friend, he sleeps in the bed next to mine. I can't stop thinking about him all the time. And sometimes when he's asleep, I pull him pajamas down and I right go with myself. And I create an unholy mess in the bed. And even after I do it, and I think I might be able to go to sleep, I start thinking about other lads and all the things I want to do to them. And do you know what a blowjob is, Father? Because I started writing stories about the lads I like, and particularly about my friend Julian. I started using words like that. And there was an almighty crashing sound from opposite me. I looked up, startled. The shadow of the priest in the darkness had vanished, and in its place a beam of light was streaming in from above. Is that you, God? I asked, looking up towards its source. From outside the confessional I could hear shouts, and I opened the door to peep outside. The priest had fallen out of his box. I was lying on the floor, crushing his chest. He must have been at least 80 years old, and the parishioners were leaning over him, crying out for help as his face turned blue. I looked down at him, my mouth open, and he slowly raised a gnarly finger and pointed it at me. His lips parted, I could see how yellow his teeth were. Am I forgiven, Father? I asked. Are my sins forgiven? His eyes rolled in his head, his entire body gave one great convulsion, he let out a roar, and that was it. He was gone. God bless us, father's dead, said an elderly man who'd been kneeling on the floor supporting the priest's head. Do you think he forgave me, I asked, before he croaked, I mean. Oh, he did, I'm sure of it, said the man, taking my hand and letting the priest's head fall rather hard against the marble floor, a tinny sound echoing around the church. And he'd be happy to know that his last act on this earth was to spread God's forgiveness. Thank you, I said, feeling cheered by this. I left the church as the ambulance men made their way inside. It was an unusually sunny day, and truth be told, I did feel absolved, even if I knew that the feelings I'd hidden inside myself wouldn't be going away anytime soon. The next morning, I awoke to the news that Julian had been found. A group of special branch officers had followed leads that led them to a farmhouse in Cavan, and he was discovered locked in a bathroom while his three captors slept outside. One was killed, and the other two were under arrest. Missing a toe, a thumb, and an ear, the rest of him was still intact, and he'd been taken to a hospital to begin his recovery. Now, had I been a person of more religious scruple, I might have believed that God had answered my prayers. But the fact was, 
before going to sleep that night, I'd already committed a few more sins. <laughs> so instead, I put it down to good detective work on the part of our Garda Shikona. It seemed like the most convenient explanation to me. <laughs> I'd like to open it to everyone here to see if there are any questions or comments from the floor. Is there or confessions. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to confess on all this. Not really a question, John. Uh, congratulations on, on your novel. It sounds wonderful, and I'm thank dying you. to read it. But I'd particularly like to congratulate you and thank you for highlighting the, the I suppose, the inequity that exists between the perception of male and female writers. And you're the first man that has said this whom I believe means it. So thank you very much. It means a great deal to other female writers to hear things like this. It does feel like things are changing slowly. A, li a, a little bit, but I, I think this, the, the problem sometimes though is there are still the, what I call the chosen ones, where there's one or two people who are instantly allowed to be, be literary, and others who aren't. You know, and you know I have a lot of female runner friends who have real arguments with their publishers about jacket design, and um, you know publishers who want to put pictures of like a girl lying back with a leg in the air, but only forget me not or something. You know, and the novel is about you know, gang rape or something, and you think, you know, this is crazy, and, you know, men don't have to have those conversations. And, you know, Ian McEwan says that when women stop reading, that's when the novel does. Hi. Um, I was struck by the wonderful dialogue in that last section, and um, how hilarious it was, and I was wondering, um, for you, is writing dialogue between characters, is it a different process to, say, some of the more narrative parts of the book, or is it the same? Um, I think it's, it's essentially the same, but I really do like writing dialogue. Which is strange in a way because I've tried to write scripts in the past and I just can't do it. I can't just write dialogue without all the, the prose that separates it. Um, but when I get into like, a scene like that where it's a back and forth in a confession box, you know, I, I could I could write that all day long and have a huge amount of fun with it. But I just couldn't continue forever. I'd have to I'd have to write the prose. So it's um, I don't really like one more than the other. It's a it's a balancing act. And again, like. I keep coming back to this that everything seems just very instinctive to me, you know, that you you switch when it feels right to switch. Hi, yeah, um, the book's dedicated to John Irving. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your friendship with John Irving and maybe a little bit about how important that role between older, you know, um, more established writers and younger writers coming up is? And maybe as a secretly aside question, what's your favourite John Irving novel? Well, I started reading John Irving when I was about 16 or 17. I remember reading. Um, the Cider House Rules was my first one, and it it was it just blew me away completely. You know how you could write a novel that was so funny, so dramatic, dealing with such a serious subject. For those who haven't read Cider House Rules, the basic premise is an orphan um, growing up um, in an orphanage, obviously, where the the head of the orphanage is a, also performs abortions and teaches this boy to perform them, but then he grows up and doesn't want to. Um, and uh, I just loved it, and I went on and all the books that John had published um, at the time, read them, and he immediately became my favourite writer. And then sometime later, when I published my first novel in 2000, um, I've only written two fan letters in my life. Um, one was to the kids from Fame, when I was <laughs> nine, who, who didn't write them. Um, which was very disappointing because my younger sister also wrote to them and they wrote back to her. Um, but then I wrote this letter to John Irving when I was 29 and I sent him a copy of my first novel, Lucky the Time, and a letter, a fanboy letter, basically saying, you know, you really inspired me and so on. Um, and anyway, he, he, he was kind enough to read both the letter and the novel and get back to me. And that was 17 years ago and we, we struck up a friendship um, from then. And he's, yeah, he's just, he's been a real mentor to me over the years and, and a very good friend. And, this novel is, I suppose, my most Irving-esque in the sense that it, I'm trying to capture some of that wit and drama that he manages to combine so much. But also most of his, uh, many of his books um, deal with what he calls sexual misfits. Um, you must remember John Irving was writing about transgender people in the world according to Gar, which was about 1977. And you know, now it's a subject which is, seems to be everywhere. But in the 1970s, not so much, particularly in Gar, where the transgender character was an NFL football player, Robert Muldoon, who becomes Roberto Muldoon. Um, and of course, Garth, you know, going back to what we were saying earlier there as well, is such a strongly feminist novel. You think of Jenny Fields um, with her book and um, what is her line in it? You know, I, I wanted a child, but I didn't want to share my life with a man. 
and the Ellen Jamesians, you know, Ellen James is a rape victim in the book, and her, her rape has cut off her tongue, so she can't um, speak about it, and so all her supporters cut off their tongues, which is something that Garp, object, anyway, going into the whole story of Garp, but anyway, um, so anyway, he, he, yeah, he became just a very good friend and mentor, and it just felt right that this book should be dedicated to him for that, subject, for that reason. And in terms of that uh, general relationships between them, I think um, I think it's really important that established writers read young writers. I'm, I read uh, debut novels all the time. Um, I love reading debut novels, um, seeing you know who's new and when you can give somebody a, a helpful hand in some way, whether it's a quote, whether it's a good review, as long as you're being honest about it, you know, not just saying it for the sake of it. But if you read something you think is good, I think you should use whatever little power that you have to get people to read it. Um, on which note, um, the, in terms of debut novels, the best ones I've read this year, uh, Larchfield by Polly Clark, I don't know if anybody's read that one, uh, which is a wonderful novel about W.H. Auden, which brings us back where we started. Um, um, a really terrific novel, so I'd recommend that one. Has John Irving read, read the book? Yes, he has, yes, yes, yes. He hated it. Oh. <laughs> no, 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 he seems like it. John's actually going to be interviewing me in Toronto um, at the festival. Now, I've interviewed him a few times in England and Ireland, so he's going to do the sharing of the session. How do you feel about that? Um, I was a little nervous, actually. Um, yeah, a little nervous. I, he said he's got a few surprises to bring me. I, I asked him one question once on stage where I don't know if you, I'm sure many of you have read his books, and bears are an obsession of his in his books. Um, and I asked him whether he owns a bear suit, and um, if he does, does he put it on and dance around the house in it or anything? And, um, he looked at me, well, he had the same reaction that you're all having right now, which is what? <laughs> Is that embarrassing? Um, so, yeah. anyway. Somebody's starting out in the writing game. I'm interested in this mysterious process you're talking about, and I'm wondering, can you pinpoint when that kicked in? I mean, that sort of thing where you are sort of living with the novel in your head all the time. Is it something that happened when you became a full time writer, or at what point in your career do you think that's. I can tell you a moment. That I can tell you a moment that actually would answer that question very well. Before my first novel was published, and uh, as most writers would have, I got like three, I think, on my computer that weren't published and that weren't good enough. And I guess each one was maybe a little bit better than the one before, but not good enough yet. And all of those novels were all set today or then, you know, in the 1990s or whatever, and um, all about basically a young guy, you know, basically based on myself, um, trying to write a novel about that when not very much was happening to me. And when I started writing um, The Thief of Time, which was a historical novel, and I made the, the decision that I was going to not write about myself, anybody I knew, anything like that. And I think it's in the second chapter, or the third chapter, which is set in 1920s Hollywood, and the character um, comes across Charlie Chaplin. And I've always been a bit of a Chaplin obsessive, and he spends the whole chapter in, in, chapter in Chaplin's presence. And I was putting words into Chaplin's mouth, and. And I can remember writing that and thinking, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This feels right suddenly. You know, weirdly, writing about somebody else rather than writing about, you know, a 25-year-old in Dublin getting up and going to work every day and doing nothing, really. Um, it just suddenly felt right. And that's, in a way, why I wrote so many historical novels or historically-based novels uh, in the years that followed it. I just instinctively felt that way. Where did you get the idea for the Why on the Strike to Jones? I, well, I've been a student, a quite a serious student of Holocaust-related literature for, for many years, since I was a teen, and read widely on it. Uh, never thought I would write about it. You know, I didn't think I, I didn't have any family member or anything through that time. So, and it was just one of those things, again, where an idea comes to you, and the, the very simple idea came to me for that was an image in my head of two boys sitting on a fence talking to each other. And I knew immediately where the fence was, and from that the entire novel sprung. And um, similar to what I was just saying about um, the Chaplin moment in Fifth Time, that um, when I sat down to write that, and writing it from a child's perspective, but as a third person, uh, in a sort of a fairy tale like way, within two pages, it just felt instinctively right to me. And I just felt I knew what I was doing and powered ahead. But where ideas come from, you, you never really know. I mentioned earlier, though, that, that if you're engaged with, like, I read constantly and I'm writing constantly. So my brain is open to ideas all the time. Um, 
and th in that way that when one plums, I know how to grab it, really. You know, I, I, I recognize one when I think of one or I see one on the street or somebody says something, uh, I recognize it. And I think the more that we read and write, the more um, we're able to do that. So with striped pajamas, it was that. It was a simple image. And I thought if I let this one go, I'll regret it. What are the um, things that obsess you? Just while we're getting like over here, you know, you said John Irvin's obsessed with bears. Are there oh, other yeah. strange Murakami cats that sneak into um, John Bond fiction? Or? Uh, oh, well, there's... Th I always say that when writers get dogs, dogs will always show up in, in their fiction. And there's always almost al almost always a Cavalier King Charles in my books. Now, Robbie Doyle also has Cavalier King Charles, but I don't think he shows, has them in his books. So there's that. Um, what else do I obsess with? Um, not much really, I don't think. Not that I can think of. Can I just ask you to talk a bit about the children's literature that you've written? Mm. Um, does that feel when you sit down to write it very different? to sitting down to write a novel for adults, or what are the implications? It feels absolutely no different at all, and, and I don't think it should. You know, it's, um, the big differences between the two for me are, as I mentioned, about first versus third person, the perspective I'm going to take. In the young people's books, I feel like I need to be sort of an omniscient narrator. Um, they're also shorter, but the themes in the young people's books are every bit as serious as the themes in the adult books. The language, I don't make it any simpler. Um, I can remember several times going into schools where the kids have been asked to make lists of the words they don't understand, and then they look them up. And I like those lists to be pretty long, to be honest. You know, I think, oh, yeah, look them up. There's a dictionary over there, or, you know, fine. Um, I think, you know, they, people generally say that we're going through a sort of real golden age of writing for young people at the moment. There are so many terrific writers around the world writing for young people who aren't patronizing children, condescending to them, um, taking really serious subjects and writing about it. And I don't think there's any subject that you can't write about for children. I think it's the approach that you take to it. You know, you don't want to scare children. You don't want them necessarily to have to grow up sooner than they should. But reality hits into children's lives as it does into adults. War, for example, which I've written about in three children's books, um, doesn't distinguish between whether you're an adult or a child. Death doesn't distinguish between whether you're an adult or a child. Um, almost everything, you know, other than say falling in love, which doesn't really happen to you when you're seven years old or something, um, almost everything that happens to an adult can happen to a child. So that's the focus I tend to take is put a child in a very adult situation and see how they react to it. Um, with gay writing, uh, it feels as if there is, I think a lot of writers talk about. Uh, the need to include the capital T, capital H history yeah. very much, and that needs to be present in a lot of things. So, and obviously you're dealing with the history of Ireland as well. Did you feel like you had to constantly be balancing the dual history that you're sort of concerned with? Or did you have to think that this is a person who is not, who is not touched by that sort of can, canonical sense that a lot of gay people have of their own history? Because that's really an American history almost. Yeah. You know? Um, I didn't feel I had to balance it too much because I, I, other, other, than for the, um, other than for gay men and women during that time, I don't think it was a big issue for society, so to speak, in the way that, say, maybe the subjugation of women was, you know, the way that the church would have controlled things and so on. There wouldn't have been a lot of talk about sort of equal rights or anything like that in the 40s or the 50s or the 60s. So I didn't feel that I had to kind of go... There was almost a history that... The history was very underground, um, covert. You know, so many, the real history of gay men and women in this country, and I would assume other countries, is, is, is marriage. You know, it's people who are now in their sort of 90s or who are dead now or something and who got married because it was the, the thing to do. You married somebody of the opposite gender. And there was, you know, if you, if you were like 40 years old and a single man, working in a school, well, you know, there'd be suspicion. And so most, most people got married and didn't care about the effect they were having on their either husband or wife um, and condemning them to a, a fairly, you know, loveless relationship in, uh, in a way. So uh, I don't know if that really answers your question, but I think it's, it's, it's really about um, society, how, how society treated anybody who wasn't part of the ruling establishment class, which is Catholic men.
Um, just one tiny little question out from me, John. What's next? It feels like every book has been a fresh, new, brilliant challenge. So what's? Uh, yeah, I'm working on one at the moment. So I was working on it this morning before driving up here. Um, it's, again, it's it's well, it's set between sort of the the eighties and today, and um, it's a better writer. Uh, it's a better writer who isn't a very good writer. Um, so whereas Maud is good, this person is terrible. So. <laughs> So, it's autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so that's I'm, I'm hoping to have that out in the next sort of eighteen months. Or so. uh, thank you all very much for coming. Here's the book. It's going to be outside. John's going to be happy to sign. Uh, please join me in thanking him very much. Thank you. Hello, it was rather remiss of me not to introduce Peggy, who introduced John. <laughs> Peggy is um, she is from Northern Ireland. She's from Larne originally, but she's now lives in Scotland. And she's director of the Dundee Literary Festival. We're delighted she's with us today and tomorrow to introduce our authors at lunchtime. Peggy, thank you very much. <laughs>